When I started to write my first book, <coughs> The Only Way to Cross, I was determined I wasn't going to treat Titanic at all, because it had been done so well by so many before me. But I made a discovery that some of you may have made as well, which is this, that if you look at one picture, see one film, examine any book, you are drawn compellingly into that story. It is the irresistible passenger saga. And so, chapter three of The Only Way to Cross is called Olympic Titanic. Olympic was the first of the class, Titanic the second. And in those days, there were many more survivors alive than there are today. The last survivor left us two years ago, Milvina Dean. She was a nine-week-old baby when she was carried on board by her mother. And what did she remember? Nothing. All that she had learned, she learned by rote from her parents. So when reporters came around on the anniversary, she told them what she remembered. She remembered nothing. But she was the last survivor on the Titanic to be alive. But when I was doing my research in the late 60s, there were many more, and I interviewed in depth three survivors. I want to share some of their words with you. The first was a quartermaster called George Rowe, and it's interesting, of the class of occupation on the Titanic, all the quartermasters survived for a very good reason. They were all assigned to lifeboats. George Rowe was on duty on the after docking bridge on the starboard side on the night of the 14th of April, 1912. And suddenly he saw, out of the night, what he first thought to be a three-masted schooner. And the iceberg had brushed past the ship and vanished astern. George Rowe then noticed that the Titanic stopped, then started again, and then stopped forever. Just drifted. And he wasn't informed or relieved about anything. And then at 12.32, he saw a lifeboat raying away from the starboard side of the ship. Later, he was called to the bridge, summoned by Commodore Smith, and asked to bring with him a box of what he described as detonators, rockets. Commodore Smith was determined to arouse some response from a mystery ship floating nearby, which we know now was the Leyland Liner Californian. And she was no more than four miles distant, George Rowe told me. And what they were trying to do was to arouse some response. They tried wireless to no effect. The officer of the watch on the Californian from 8 to 12 was a man called Grove. Charles Groves, and at 20 to 12, he had seen a large liner, as he described it, come up and stop, and then all the lights changed as she turned. The lights seemed to go out. And then the large liner, it's interesting, all the California officers never said the word Titanic, even the British inquiry. They said the large liner, as though they'd been drilled. They wanted to keep it neutral. And when he was relieved by Herbert Stone, the next officer of the watch, from 12 to 4, he pointed out the large liner. And then he didn't go back to his cabin because he was a great amateur wireless enthusiast. Wireless was a fairly recent toy on board ships. And he was teaching himself Morse. And he used to go to the wireless operator's cabin, the man whose name was Cyril Evans. And he came in as just as Evans was about to go to sleep. He was a single operator on board and he couldn't stay on duty 24 hours a day. So he said, OK, if I listen in Sparks, and Evans said, go ahead, and rolled over and faced the wall. So he took the headset, put it on his ears. But he didn't know enough to wind the Maggie, as it was called, the magnetic clockwork magnetic detector. And that would have made the set come alive. But it didn't happen. He heard nothing. And even he, as a relative amateur, would have understood the significance of CQD or SOS, the two distress signals that were sent out over the air that night. So there was no wireless communication between Californian and Titanic. Groves hung up the headset and went down to his cabin and went to bed. Officer Herbert Stone was on the watch from 12 to 4. He had the apprentice officer, James Gibson, with him. And the two men saw the large liner. And then at about 20 minutes to 1, a series of rockets came up from the line. And there occurred, as Walter Lord had said, who wrote the foreword to The Only Way to Cross for Me, and the man who wrote A Night to Remember, 
Walter said there occurred the most incredible conversation ever heard on the bridge of an Atlantic liner. He went something like this. He went, Mr. Stone, what's that? Why, well, those are rockets, Gibson. Is something the matter, do you suppose? I don't know, we'll ask the captain. Captain Law, the captain of the Californian, was asleep on the chart room sofa directly below their feet. He blew down the speaking tube but blew a whistle near the captain's ear. He woke up and said, yes, what is it? <coughs> captain, there's a large liner, the large liner again. There's a large <coughs> liner over here firing rockets. What color rockets? inquired the captain. It's a good question. Because even after the advent of wireless, ships meeting each other on the North Atlantic used to send up what were called company signals. They didn't identify the ship, they identified the owning company. The company signals of the White Star Line were two green lights. The Cunard Line was two blue lights. The French Line had three colors. Red at the bow, white at the bridge, blue at the stern. It took three men to set up company signals on the French Line ship, that patriotic salvo. So, quite naturally, Captain Lord wondered if the rockets he was seeing were company signals. No captain, said Herbert Stone. These are white rockets throwing stones. <coughs> One would have thought even a child of the period would know that white rockets throwing stones in mid-ocean would mean only one thing, distress. Let me know what happens. Keep horsing the ship, he said, and hung up and rolled over and went back to sleep. When the liner went away, as they say, and when they say went away, did it mean it sank? Or did it continue out of this curious two hour and 40 minute interruption in the mid-ocean journey. Well, then the liner went away. Gibson was sent down to tell the master. He went down to the chart room. He says he woke up the captain and told him, but the captain disremembers. It wasn't until 4.30 the next morning that the captain woke up and he decided to try and find out if the wireless operator could come on the air and find out if any mystery of this large line had been solved. And the Spark 011 went on the air and he discovered what then the rest of the world knew, that in the midst of a maiden voyage, Titanic had struck an iceberg and gone to the bottom with appalling loss of life. Walter Law, the man who was kind enough to write a foreword to my book, was a dear friend of mine. About nine years ago, he succumbed after a long, gallant battle with Parkinson's disease. But when he was well, we used to meet in New York. I live in New York and he did too. and so. We used to have lunch about once a month. And when two maritime historians get together, and one of them's Walter Law, the conversation is inevitably Titanic. And we talked about Titanic month after month at those lunches. And I remember Walter in a sort of whimsical mood one day said, you know, John, if there were a, if there was some sort of magic time machine, if you could go back in history, I wouldn't go to the Titanic. I'd go to the California. And I'd go to the chart room and I would drag Captain Lord by his booted heels off that sofa and march him to the bridge and make him bring his ship alongside Titanic. Hundreds, over a thousand lives might have been saved. But as it was, the Californian remained the ship that stood still and rendered no assistance whatsoever. And it's interesting, in the aftermath of the tragedy, Captain Lord and the California was perceived as the villain, and he was the man who at 10 o'clock, when he first saw the ice, had stopped his ship. And Commodore Smith, who lost his life but was sanctified as the hero of the evening, had barreled along 22 knots imprudently. Even though the night was clear, he didn't have sufficient warning of that iceberg that struck the side. The second survivor I spoke with in depth was a passenger. I knew her as Edith Russell. Her name at the time was Edith Rosenbaum. He was in, she was a New Yorker. And she was in the rag trade. She had a wonderful business. She invented it herself. She used to go to Paris every spring. She would buy a lot of Paris spring fashions. She had five trunks full of them. She'd been on the boat train and come down to Cherbourg. She had them on board, and when she got back to New York, her staff would take all the labels out, put her labels in, and they would be New York spring fashion. <laughs> it was a million dollar idea, and it made her a lot of money. She was traveling all the time. And she was not alone in being confused about what was, what was really happening on board Titanic after the collision of the iceberg. 
There was no uh, tannoy or loudspeaker whereby Commodore Smith could address, address the entire ship's company. It didn't exist. And if he had, how would he explain the appalling shortage of lifeboats? The seats were only 1,100 for 2,200 that were needed. So word that came down from the bridge tended to spread as though by rumor or myth. One of the improbable rumors was uh, women and children who were reluctant to enter the lifeboats and leave this apparently comfortable and warm ship. Uh, it was said, get into the lifeboats now. Tomorrow morning you can re-embark for breakfast. <laughs> Another myth had it, and this is the one clearly that Edith Rosenbaum subscribed to, was that somehow, nobody knew how, Titanic was going to be towed to Halifax, some distance away. And some of the people in the lifeboats had said, row for Halifax, a long row. <laughs> But that's what Eva thought was going to happen, so she summoned her steward, a man called Robert Wareham. She said, Wareham, here are the keys to my trunks. They're all labeled and ready to go. And when we get to Halifax, will you make sure they get on Railway Express to my address in New York? And Wareham, who'd come from below and seen firsthand mail sacks floating on e deck, said, you kiss those trunks goodbye, Miss Rosenbaum. I've got five little ones in Southampton, and I'm worried. And yet reasonably worried. He did not survive. And he left a widow and five children. And just one of many cruel dwellings in Southampton. A great hush descended on the city, said one of the newspapers in Southampton. The upper windows were blanked out with white sheets. The lower shutters closed and a piece of purple crepe hung on the doorknob. And the widow Wareham was distraught. She said to her five sons, you cannot any of you ever go to sea? I couldn't go through anything like this again. And one of them defied her. His name was Cyril. He was the youngest. And he ran away and he joined the Cunard Line and he started as a commie waiter. And he became a chef de long. And when I met him in 1956 on the Queen Mary, he was the manager of the Miranda Grill, the extra tariff restaurant in all the Mary. And his nickname was Flamer Wareham. And he was called Flamer Wareham because he suzetted crepe for such a vengeance and so much brandy that he scorched the ceiling from the veranda. <laughs> that was the son of Edith Rosenbaum Stewart. It would be safe to say that Edith Rosenbaum was dressed about as inappropriately for a shipwreck as the magic. She was wearing a hobble skirt. And gentlemen, if you're not sure, well, and ladies too, who knows what a hobble skirt is? I happen to know. Gathered at the waist, flares out, gathered again at the knees, and flares out again. The height of fashion, 1912, was rather confining. You could only walk like this. I'm indebted to a fellow passenger on a former ship who shared with me some doggerel that her mother told her. Come on, boys, if you want to flirt, here comes a girl in a hobble skirt. You can kiss her and hug her as much as you please. You'll never get that skirt up over her knee. <laughs> Compounding the felony, she was wearing backwards, high-heeled, apricot-colored pumps. And she carried with her, as she did everywhere, a good luck charm, a gift from her parents, because she'd been in a motor accident in France once, where other people in the car had been killed. She didn't survive. And this was a little music box in the shape of a toy pig covered in brown and white pony fur. And when you twisted its tail, it played the maxis. It come from Paris. And she carried this as a good luck charm on every ship she went to. And she bore the bejesus out of her fellow passengers printing this wretched music box and there it is. So finally she was ready to go. She had on her hobble skirt and she had on her warmest cloak and jacket and her life jacket. And she left the cabin and she went to the boat deck. When she got there, she found for convenience they'd lower the boat down to A deck, so she had to go back down with the cabin. <laughs> and when she got there, since there was a slight list to starboard this vessel, the lifeboat was leading about a yard away from the side of Titanic. And Crewman had improvised a bridge of folded deck chairs. And Edith, there's no way wearing this costume I can possibly get into that lifeboat. And a clever crew, who knew her well, seized the pig, hurled it into the lifeboat. One way or another, Edith followed. And so <laughs> the third survivor I spoke with was unquestionably the most endearing. 
And her name came to me in a curious way. It came from my mother. She knew I was looking for survivors. She said, you better see if Violet Jessup is still alive. I said, who's Violet Jessup? She said, she was my stewardess on the Majestic in 1926. This was 1970. How many of you can remember your steward from two or three cruises? <laughs> this was 44 years earlier. I said, why do you remember her name? Well, my mother told me, she said, I've not been feeling well. I've had some surgery before that crossing, and I wasn't sleeping well. And my dear little Irish stewardess, Violet Jessup, sat up with me through the long hours, and the two women talked about their favorite ships, which were always white star ships. They both loved the Adriatic, which was my mother's favorite ship. And Violet confessed she nearly capsized in a storm on the Adriatic one day. But the thing that stuck with my mother but Violet told her during one of those late night gab fests, told her that she had been on the Olympic when it had been struck by the hawk. She sank on the Titanic and she sank on the Britain. She had been on all three of the Olympic class ships in harm's way and survived them all. One would have thought that crewmen seeing Violet Jessup come up that way. <laughs> I belong to an organization which in those days was called the Titanic Enthusiasts of America. We prevailed upon them to change its name to Titanic Historical Society. And they did a useful thing, aside from publishing a monthly journal, they also kept track of survivors. And if you remember, you can write them. I said, do you have an address for Violet Jessup? Is she still living? Yes, she's living in retirement in Suffolk. Here's her address. I wrote her a letter. I said I was researching a book about ocean liners, and I would be in London with my car that summer, I'd like to come down and say hello to her. So she sent me back a note, gave me explicit driving directions, and one wet Sunday in July, I left London and descended into darkest Suffolk. And I found out, I made the discovery, that every dripping lane in Suffolk looked like every other dripping lane, and I got hopelessly lost. And it wasn't until two hours later than our Side rendezvous, I finally made the right turn down the right dripping lane, and there at the end was a little thatched cottage where Violet Jessup had retired. And she was standing outside under the portico, obviously distraught, wondered where I was. And when I came and said hello to her, she said, I'm sorry, my directions were, must have been wrong. I said, No, no, I was stupid, I got lost. And I noticed, I couldn't help noticing she was quite bald, she had a wig that kept falling over one ear. And I discovered when I read her memoir that this was, had, had happened when she was abandoning the Britannic. The Brit Britannic was a hospital ship. She was on the way out to Budros to pick up wounded men. And she was empty, except for the Royal Army Medical Corps personnel and the crew. And she struck a mine in the Aegean on her way out. And the mine struck the bow, and so the bow started to go down. And Captain Bartlett was anxious to beach his ship upright in the shallows, which makes it much easier to sail. So he was driving ahead, even though the bow was going down, the stern was coming out of water. Violet was in a lifeboat, and suddenly every man in the lifeboat jumped into the water. She thought, what's going on? She looked up and she saw the lifeboat was being drawn into the huge revolving propellers. So she jumped overboard too. Like all seamen, she couldn't swim. She was wearing a life jacket, she sank like a stone, and she struggled up to the surface and came up under the lifeboat struck her head a punishing blow and started to sink again. And she thought she was finished. And then, flailing around underwater, she grasped a hand that squeezed back. There was somebody under there, under the water with her, one of the surgeons from the ship who knew her when they found out when they got to the surface. And they struggled to the surface, their lungs bursting, and they gasped lungfuls of air, and they were midst, in the midst of a carnage of broken and bloodied men cut up by those fearful propellers. And she sustained a concussion. And that concussion made it impossible for her hair to continue to grow. And by the time I came to see her, she was over 80. She was quite bald. And that's why she had that auburn wig. We went at once, once to her kitchen. And I couldn't help noticing how, despite her long years of retirement, she had lost none of her stewardesses get up and go. She reminded me so of Cunard and White saw stewards, stewardesses from my childhood. We were John and Violet immediately, and we sat down at the kitchen table, and she had a very rickety lamp. She called it the Tilly lamp, like a pressure cooker. 
and it perched on a set of legs, very rickety. And the first thing I did when I got back to London was to call Harris and ask them to send an electric kettle down to Maythorn so Violet could brew up without risking herself or her thatched roof. <laughs> and we talked, and we talked and talked. Before I tell you what she told me, let me leap ahead 25 years. Violet never saw herself in print. She's briefly at the only way to cross, but she died six months after we met. I had only one meeting to her, that wet Sunday afternoon in July of 1970. And when she died, she left pitifully few possessions, and her nieces, the Meehan sisters of Marriott Mallon, Scopel, and Sidney, had uh, got all her goods and chattels. There were very little there. The one thing was this manuscript she'd written for a literary competition in the 1930s. They didn't win the competition, and so she'd tinker with it over the years. And they thought, well, as long as Cameron's making his film, maybe our Auntie Vi's memoirs will have some currency with him. So uh, they took, I think, a blindfold and a pin, and they stabbed it on a, a list of publishers in New York. They found a yachting publisher in Dobbs Ferry called Sharon House. And they sent it to him. The publisher's name was Lothar Simon. He read it, he was impressed with it, he sent it to Walter Lord. Walter saw a violet's name on it, knowing she was a friend of mine, sent it to me, I read it overnight, and I called the publisher the next day, I said, this book must be published, there, are, there is material here that nobody knows, it's a woman who's never been interviewed. So I said, if you were agreeable, and if your nieces are agreeable, I would like to edit and annotate the manuscript and leave it some work. So I did, and it was published. And Lothar called it Titanic Survivor. And Violet was really a survivor for many reasons. She and her family had emigrated to Argentina. And they didn't become landowners on the Pampas as they hoped they would. They knew only death and destruction. Two of their children were killed by scarlet fever. Violet herself nearly succumbed. She had only one operating lung. And she was in a bed in a hospital garden in Buenos Aires and two doctors leaned over the head of the bed over her head, and one of them said, she won't make it. Well, she did. Her father was transferred to the railway, and he took the family up into the clear mountain air of Mendoza, and she recovered. And then the father died, they all went back to England, and as they had no support, Violet's mother went to become a stewardess on a ship. But her health was failing, and after five years, she had to give it up, and so, Violet, as always, entered years, 42 years of servitude aboard Ocean Rose. She could have had probably a rather good academic career because she was very bright and she had been very well schooled. But she went to sea. And I want to share with you some of her talk that she, I read, because it gives you a flavor of Violet's life on board the Orinoco tied up alongside in Kingston, Jamaica. I dressed as carefully as I could when perspiration exudes from every pore in a cabin so small that to move suddenly meant disaster to some part of one's anatomy. The sun shone in relentlessly through the tightly screwed down porthole and all the bedlam that coaling a ship entailed was concentrated overhead. The accompaniment of the devastating racket of the ship's winches working cargo, the monotony relieved now and then by the purple language of the stevedores. That was the kind of life that was commonplace on a ship in the West Indies, which is so different from anything we are familiar with today. She ultimately went and was assigned to Olympic and then to Titanic. And she was in a cabin below the waterline on the night of the 14th of April. She and her roommate, who we call Anne, she changed names in an attempt to be discreet, but her name was Anne. And the two women were in bed, Violet in the upper, Anne in the lower. And Violet had been reading a prayer, a rather complicated Irish prayer. She was a devout Irish Catholic. And she could make no sense head nor tail of it. So she folded it up, said she'd look at it when she was fresh in the morning, put it in the prayer book, and tucked it under a pillow. They turned out the light and went to sleep. 
started to go to sleep. At 11.40, she heard what she described as a jarring, crunching, ripping sound, not far from their cabin. The voices and doors slamming in the passageway. How long did that noise last? I can tell you it lasted just over eight seconds. How do I know that? Because it was a 300-foot gash. The vessel was doing 22 and a half knots, and that's eight seconds. The two women were reduced to giggle because Anne sat up and said, something has happened. Something indeed had happened. And the giggles were came nervous laughter as they hastily got dressed because they would have to go up to their first class sections and help the women and children get dressed. And as they were went up and they helped their passengers get dressed warmly, put their life jackets on and get up to the boat deck, then after the cabins were empty, they came back down to their cabin and in a curious simulacrum of normality began making the beds and tidying the cabin as though in a normal day at sea. And suddenly there was a pounding on the door and the door opened. There was a friend of theirs, a steward called Stanley. He'd been sent down to clear the cabin. He said, what do you two women do? This ship is going to sink. You've got to get up on the boat deck. And then to get them moving along, he came in and tried to impel them to get dressed in a hurry and put on the right clothes and Violet was a very clever seamstress. She made a very nice suit and hat, matching suit and hat, to wear in April in New York. And he took the hat off the shelf and the clothes press and said, now Violet, you wear that. And then he went, and Anne, what do you wear? Stanley, I'm not wearing a hat to a shipwreck. <laughs> <laughs> she wore her warmest coat, put a scarf around her head, and then she went up to leave the cabin. And she and Anne started up the companionway outside the cabin. And she looked back suddenly with a pang. She said, whereas she knew there'd be a scene in a lifeboat for herself and Anne, there'd be nothing for Stanley. And she looked back and Stanley was leaning on the door, watching him go. And Violet called. She said, you'll be coming up, Stanley, won't you? We'll see you. Yes, I'll see you later. Said that she never saw him again. Good old, ugly face, Stanley, she called him. She loved him dearly. He didn't survive. She went back to her cabin, being a conscientious steward. She wanted to make sure everything was out of the cabin. And she did it with quite surreal, walking down the alleyway with all the doors open, the lights burning, the cabins empty. Some beds made, unmade, clothes, jewelry, shoes, brushes, combs, scattered around the cabin. And in the last cabin she went into, there on the foot of bed was a little quilt, a little eiderdown. And she thought, one of my passengers might like that. So she put it around her shoulders. You know, we talk about my steward or my steward as they in return talk about my passenger. It's a nice symbiosis you don't get ashore. And then she went to the ship square to go up the main staircase to the boat deck. And the ship square is a very useless space in mid-ocean because it's really designed for port days. It's the threshold of the ship. And on port days in Southampton, it had been a madhouse of Late luggage, books, chocolates, cables, candy, visitors from ashore, company people from ashore, lost children, stewards looking for ice or a lost suitcase. But then once the doors are dog shut and the port is cleared, the ship square is useless. It has no use in mid-ocean. It's only when it gets to New York the madness will start all over again. So Violet started up the staircase that she noticed the square wasn't quite deserted because there were four men she knew very well standing over there, still in their mess gear. Commodore Smith, <coughs> Dr. O'Loughlin, the senior surgeon of the ship, Andrew Latimer, the first steward, and Thomas Andrews, the builder's representative from Harlem Wolf, the naval architect who designed the ship. He was on board as a troubleshooter. She knew them all well. And they waved at her, she waved back. That they weren't taken with seriousness of anything, John. Men normally busy on any voyage, but on a maiden voyage that just struck an iceberg and they're just standing around. <coughs> she started up the staircase, her way impeded by what she described as two impudent cut-ups. They were pantry boys, and they were struggling up the staircase carrying an enormously heavy Gladstone bag, one at each end. It was full of gold sovereigns. The purser had taken it out of the safe and said to these two boys, take this up and put it in the lifeboat. So they were laughing and jumping, <coughs> going up ahead of her, and when they got to the sill at the top of the staircase that separates indoors from out, in lifting it over the sill, one of them dropped his end and gold sovereign rolled all over the boat deck. Nobody paid the slightest attention. 
Violet went to her lifeboat, which she knew was number 16, the last one aft on the port side. It had been lowered down to deck level. It was full of women. She found the seat and got in. And next to the lifeboat were a row of men. Fathers, husbands, brothers, sons of the women in the boat. And they were all having perfectly civilized, quiet conversations. And I think what was more important was not what was said, but what wasn't said. And the men told that conventional lie that so many husbands and brothers and fathers and sons said that night, I'll be with you shortly. That civilized tenor was disrupted by the appearance of a immigrant passenger coming up from the after well deck. She was hysterical with grief. She was carrying a baby. And she thought the child was going to drown. And speaking a language that nobody understood, she put the child down on a coil of rope that was shortly be used to lower the lifeboat to the water and disappear. And Officer Moody, who was lowering the lifeboat, picked up the baby and said, here, Jessup, take this child. And Jessup took the child, and the quilt she providentially wrapped around her shoulders was perfect to wrap the baby, A, to keep it warm, and B, to protect it from the sharp blot of her cork like jacket. And then she went down to the water and floated around for four or five hours until, bitterly cold, they suddenly saw, steaming through the night, the little Cunada Carpathia, the rescue ship, firing blue rockets as she came. Carpathia was a little vessel that had left New York on the 11th of April, the day after Titanic left Southampton, and she was bound on a spring cruise in the Mediterranean, a voyage for pleasure, not for purpose. Largely Americans on board and also some uh, old people going back, immigrants going back to the, see their homelands, and so they were divided. There were cruise passengers and there were crossing passengers. And she had a single wireless operator too, a man called Harold Cotton. And Harold Cotton was sitting on the edge of his bed with the headset on, wrestling with a stubborn bootlace to take his shoes off and go to sleep, when suddenly through the headset came this electrifying call. Come quickly, old man. We've struck an iceberg and given the position. He scribbled down the position, tore off the headset, raced along the passage and went to the officer of the watch, Horace Dean, said, wake up, the captain for heaven's sake, Titanic struck an iceberg. So they went and woke up Captain Rostrum, who was the captain of the Carpathia, and he came and ordered a new course set 54 miles to the position where they'd received the message. And then he turned back and said, now Cotton, tell me this all over again. Rostrum's nickname among his crew was the Electric Spark because whenever he did something, he acted so decisively. And he had Dean call all the heads of departments, and he started to issue orders which, as though he had been planning this for his entire life, he was awesomely accurate and effective. But the chief engineer said, Chief, I want you to take all the steam, don't send it to the cabin, don't send it to the galley, it's all to go to the engine. Little Carpe put on an extra watch of Stoker, so Little Carpe had never done better than 14 knots were suddenly rattling along at 17. To the chief steward, he said, I want you to take all three of our dining rooms, first, second, and third, transform them into makeshift hospitals. We may have 2,000 people coming on board in severe need. I want you to have electric light clusters ringed by each of the port doors in the side of the hull. I want you to have hoists so that passengers can be taken up if necessary. I want to have the forward cranes broken out so the only steam you'll despair from the engine is to those winches so you can haul people up in boats and chairs if necessary. And the last thing he said before he dismissed everybody, he said, and one more thing, don't tell the passengers. I don't want them in the way. So the men dispersed all over the ship and there began this furious backstage drama as the vessel raced to the north. Among the passengers on board was a couple called Lewis and Augusta Ogden, experienced passengers. He was a sound sleeper, she was not. And in fact, they exemplified the sort of ideal marriage of the Edwardian era. He rows, she steers. <laughs> he was sleeping soundly, she was awake. And several things worried her. First, 
it was bitterly cold in the cabin. There was no heat in the steam radiator. Second, she knew the sea motion had changed. The vessel had changed course. She was an experienced enough passenger to know the motion she'd been used to for the last 24 hours, and now it was different. Furthermore, the toothbrush in the glass on the shelf above the sink in the corner of her cabin was rattling in a way it never had. And the last thing she heard on the deck overhead, the chocks being removed from the lifeboats overhead. She woke up her husband. Lewis, what's that noise upstairs? It's nothing. Go back to sleep, he said. He said, go outside and see what's happening. Somebody's outside. Put on his dressing gown, he went to the door and opened it. There was a steward as though standing on sentry duty. The steward, what's going on? What's happening with the boats? Uh, fixing the boats, sir. What for? I can't tell you, sir. <laughs> he went back into the total war department. <laughs> he said, go out again. <laughs> he went out again. Now the steward had gone, but there was Dr. McGee, a surgeon they knew well, one of the ship's doctors. Doctor, what's happening on? Nothing. Nothing at all. Is this ship on fire? Somehow Lewis Ogden was convinced Carpathia was on fire. No, it's not. It's Titanic, he finally said. What's the matter with Titanic? She struck ice, but I, you must stay in your cabin. Captain's orders. Shut the door. He went back and told the War Department again, she said. Go out again. <laughs> Open the door, then there's a crew of a trail of men carrying blankets. They were being taken down to warm on the boilers. And the doctor said, please stay in your cabin. Well, they shut the door. They both got dressed and they slipped out on deck. They found a quartermaster that Lewis Ogden had befriended some days earlier. He said, what's going on? Titanic has struck an iceberg and we're going to a rescue. But she's on the northern route, we're on the southern route. We're going north like hell, man. Now get back to your cabin, please. Well, they didn't get back to their cabin. And in 20 minutes, the entire ship knew. I don't have to tell you, gossip is the currency of shipboard. They used to say on the first Queen Elizabeth, if you went and whispered a secret into somebody's ear on the bow and then ran to the stern, by the time you got there, you would hear that same secret embellished. So all over the ship, passengers gathered. They kept out of the way, some were dressed, some had on their dressing gowns, some their overcoats over their pajamas. We had another witness on the ship that night, one of the officers, James Bissett, Billy Bissett was his nickname. He had the sharpest eyes on board and Rostrum stationed him out on the starboard bridge wing because he knew he was entering ice country. This is the kind of master Rostrum was. So he stood out there in the bitter cold behind the dodger as that protection bulwark is called and he looked back and he could see by the light of the binnacle Captain Rostrum holding his cap an inch or two above his head. His eyes were closed and his lips were moving. He was praying. He was an intensely devout man. And in the middle of this errand of mercy, he was quite naturally asking God's help. And the second thing that Bissett recalled in his wonderful memoirs was as he was staring into the night ahead, he suddenly saw a pinprick of light, a single pinprick of light directly ahead. And he didn't know what it was, but he thought maybe he'd order a course change. And he bellowed hard as starboard and Carpathia turned in a tight circle and they went past an enormous wall of black ice beside an iceberg. And what Bissett had seen was a single reflection of a star in that black ice, which leads us to believe that if Frederick Fleet and Bernard Lee in the Titanic's crow's nest had been as vigilant as Bissett, there might never have been any collision whatsoever. As they got near their position, the sun was coming up, just after four in the morning. After an awful moment, or a heartfelt moment, Rostrum saw a green light. He thought it might be Titanic riding light down near the water, but it wasn't. It was a green flare from one of the lifeboats. And the sun came up, tinging the ice pink and orange. And there was a vast debris field with lifeboats spread across it, some full, some not full, some capsized with people perched on the outsides. sides. And in the middle of the debris field, there was 
mattresses, paneling, pillows, coffee beans gouting up from the wreck below. And Rostron made a lead with his ship and one by one picked up the boat. It took four hours to get all the people on board. Violet went up in a bosun's chair and she was lowered onto the forward well deck still holding the baby which had started to cry. And they had to unfold her arm from this icy embrace. And the embrace was of course from holding the child all night. And just as they took the baby from her, the mother of the child who had reached Carpathia in another boat came and seized the baby. And never once in the three days that followed, even in dumb ship, did she attempt to thank the stewardess who had saved her child's life. We'll hear more about that child later. Music haunts Titanic. Music haunts Titanic because of what I describe as the eight gallant bandsmen, the musicians, who played out on deck till the very end. There were eight of them, including the leader, a man called Wallace Harthy, who was a violinist and also the leader. And they'd been mustered by the chief purser to play in the main lounge, which they did. One of the pianists dropped out, so there were seven, a piano septet. And then later we find them in the top of the main staircase, where there was a piano chained to the wall. And they're dressed in overcoats and life jackets, so they must have been sent down to their quarters to get warmly dressed. And then they went out and played on deck, and there was no piano out on deck, so the other pianists dropped out, and knowing the ship's musicians as I do, I know they probably stayed near their companions who were playing. What was now a string sextet out on deck, Catgut does not like cold weather. It was difficult to keep their instruments in tune. It was very hard for violinists to put their instruments under their chin because of the cork of their life box. And not easy for the cellist to play standing up. I asked a cellist friend of mine if he could play standing up for a minute. He said, it's extremely uncomfortable. They had no music stands and no light. So they had to play music they knew. And everybody wanted to know what was the last tune the band played on Titan. Providing a hint was the surviving radio operator from Titanic, Harold Blind. He'd been on an overturned collapsible and somebody sat on his feet that was jammed in between two ridges on the overturned lifeboat. And they were severely injured. And the doctors couldn't promise him that he would save his feet. And he was coming off the ship last. He was the last person to come off the ship. And as he did, the reporters always knew the Marconi men and said, Bride, Bride, what was the band playing? And he turned over his shoulder before he got into the ambulance to go to St. Stephen's. He said, they were playing, they were playing autumn. And he was gone. So the hymnologists ran back to their hymn books and they found a hymn tune, a hymn tune called Autumn. And the verse Third stanza said something about, O oh Lord, hold up my head in mighty waters. So that was they said, it was autumn. Walter Lord wrote a final book, his last book in 1986. It was called The Night Lives On, and the night, of course, was the night to remember. And in it, he wanted to clear up a lot of loose ends that had always worried him. And one of them was that hymn tune autumn. He said very cogently, we don't know hymns by the names of their tunes, we know them by their first lines. And if I said to you, you all know the hymn tune, say, Gertrude, you think I was mad, but it's the hymn tune of onward Christian soldiers. So Walter thought there was another autumn he had to search, and he searched all the song sheets, 1910, 1911, 1912, and he found it. He found a little bittersweet waltz written by an Englishman called Archibald Joyce, and he gave it as so many had wanted did a French name, and he called it Songe d'Automne, Thought of Autumn, Dreams of Autumn, Songe d'Automne. And this was a great hit in London, it was a great hit in New York, and so it was played on the ships in between. And it was something they knew well, they could play in the dark, they could play it from memory. I thought you might like to hear a little bit of it. I had it recorded by some ship's musician earlier. Would you start track 13, please? <laughs>
Not one of the musicians survived. They all drowned. And the leader, Wallace Hartley, when his body was found, he had a music case strapped across his chest. Was it sheet music he hoped maybe to play on deck? Or just sheet music that he was very fond of and wanted to keep? I never know what was in that music case. Someday I hope to find out. But when Wallace Hartley was buried in his hometown of Colne in Lancashire, no less than six brass bands played him to his last rest, playing the Dead March from Saul. And he was buried. Thank you. Three more things and then I'll let you go. The first, there was an American bad science fiction writer called Morgan Robertson, who in 1898 wrote a book called Futility. Futility was the story of the Atlantic's largest liner that sailed from Liverpool to New York on her maiden voyage. And in the midst of the ocean, she struck an iceberg. That's chapter one. Chapter two, the survivors on the ship find there are Eskimos living on the iceberg, and it goes crazy. <laughs> but what's important and what's miraculous is the name that Morgan Robertson chose for his mythic liner. It was Titan. T-I-T-A-N. It lacked only the suffix I-C to be Titanic. And this was written 14 years before Titanic sailed. By the way, another good reason we suppose that saint Thomas was played on board the ship was that on the Laconia in 1914, the bandmaster struck it up one evening during a concert. And a woman came out of the audience and she said, would you mind not playing that tune? They played it on Titanic the night my husband drowned. So that's good reason to suppose that Walter had found the right song. The second thing I share with you is something Violet told me. She said that sometimes when there was a thunderstorm down the line, it would strike the telephone line and her telephone used to jangle in the middle of the night. And she said that night it was jangling, it was about three in the morning, and suddenly she realized it was ringing. So she staggered out of bed and went to the hall. In those days, every English person kept their telephone in the hall, not in the bedroom or the kitchen or the bathroom, always in the hall. She went out and picked it up. And a woman's voice said, is this Violet Jessup? Yes, it is. Who is this? Is this Violet Jessup, Jessup who rescued a baby on Titanic that night? Yes, who is this? Who is calling? And the woman laughed and she said, I was that baby, and then hung up. I said, Violet, it may have been village children playing a joke on you. She said, no, John, until you came today, I've never told anybody the story about that baby. Nobody knows about the baby except you and me. So we're left with this incredible mystery. If it really was the baby calling her, how had she found Violet living in retirement in the depths of suffering? And why call in the middle of the night? Was she calling from America and didn't know about time change? There's no way we can tell. Somebody said to me in the last cruise I was on, said, well, you know, she may have been dreaming. She may have dreamed it. And I said, no. Violet had all her marbles. She had a few of mine, too. <laughs> and the last thing I share with you is really nothing. But it's also everything. In the water that night, floating in the water without a life jacket, was a bar steward from Titanic called Harold Fillimore. And he was clutching onto a bundle of deck chairs that had been lashed with twine, thrown overboard by Thomas Andrews and the chief deck steward as flotation devices. Both those men lost their lives, but many lives were saved thanks to their industrious foresight. So he was holding on for dear life to this Bottle the deck chairs, his only means of staying afloat, and suddenly behind him came an Englishman, still in black tie, paddling through the night. He had a life jacket on, and he clutched the other side of the deck chair so the two men were face to face in the middle of this bitterly cold ocean. Fillimore didn't know him, he didn't know Fillimore. They were just two men adrift in that water. 
And Philemon said later that the Englishman looked over his head at the great vault of stars overhead, looked over to the upended Titanic, which was about to take the final plunge, looking as Edith Rosenbaum had said, like the flat iron building, a real New Yorker's image. And they could both hear the cries of 1,500 of their fellow souls freezing, shrieking, dying in that 28 degree water. And then the Englishman turned back to Philibor and he said, what a night, what a night. And then he relinquished his hold on the deck chairs, he was an extremist and he drifted away, they were probably the last words he ever spoke. What a night, what a night indeed. Thank you for sharing what we need this afternoon.